My name is Mark Tran. I cover global development issues for The Guardian, uh, the newspaper in London. Uh, my fellow panelists, Roy Prosterman, founder of Landessa, a, an organization that uh, fights for land rights for the world's poorest. Anne Roland from Nestle, works on uh, research and development and sustain sustainability issues. Irit Tamir uh, from Oxfam, and Angus Kelly from Syngenta. I thought I'd start by um, reminding ourselves that the right to food is actually a human right under international law which protects the rights of all human beings to feed themselves in dignity, either by producing their food or by purchasing it. And uh, Olivier de Scouter, the UN Special Rapporteur for the Right to Food, refines uh, the right to food uh, in this way. And I think it's worth reading his definition in full. He, he, this is what he says. It's the right to have regular, permanent, and unrestricted access, either directly or by means of financial purchases, to quantitatively and qualitatively adequate and sufficient food, corresponding to the cultural traditions of the people to which the consumer belongs, and which ensure a physical and mental, individual and collective fulfilling and dignified life free of fear. It's quite a mouthful and um, quite, in a way, idealistic notion of the right to food. Um, but it's, it's a strong vision uh, from which we're quite far away from. Um, there's been progress on the first millennium development goal in reducing the proportion of people suffering from extreme poverty and extreme hunger, but there's still about 800 million people who go to bed hungry, so we're a long way from fulfilling that notion. And invariably, we, many of those who go hungry are smallholder farmers, many of them in Africa, many of them women. So the issue of food justice revolves very um, tightly around uh, small smallholder farmers, people who farm less than one hectare. And it's interesting in the, in the renewed policy focus on agriculture, how smallholder farmers are very central to this whole debate. And agriculture is, a very, is at a very interesting uh, juncture at the moment. It's, it's back in fashion, in a way. It was out of fashion in the 1980s for three decades. Um, structural adjustment programs in Africa didn't help, help reduce, the, the, they contributed to the reduction of agricultural advisory extension services. And it's only and now since 2008 the food price rise crisis that policymakers are again focusing on the importance of agriculture. Uh, we've had a flurry of initiatives. Uh, in 2009, the L'Aquila Initiative, where rich countries pledged to uh, invest $22 billion. Uh, last year, at the um, G8 summit, President Obama launched a new alliance um, designed to bring in the private sector to invest in Africa. And only this year, we've had the uh, Nutrition Summit in London, chaired by David Cameron, uh, seeking pledges to focus specifically on nutrition. So that's where we are now. And uh, so, which brings me to the panelists. So I'm going to throw it over to Roy to talk about the, the the one of the uh, suggestions from the panel from from the from the project was 
All panelists are expected to share examples of a practical program they have implemented which strengthen the rule of law as it relates to food security. So Roy, you're the first one to go on that. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, delighted to see uh, this many people turning out on a late afternoon after a very, uh, very long day in, in effect, the classroom. Uh, I need to remind myself that I have eight minutes and not my usual 50, which uh, is my instinct. Uh, and I was, uh, in terms of media, I was intrigued uh, to see when two or three years ago uh, it was announced that uh, half of the world's population is now urban that not an, a single story appeared, as far as I could see, uh, that talked about the necessary correlate, that is, that as of 2010, half of the world's population is still rural. Uh, and those people, by and large, make their living from the land. The land is their principal source of income, security, uh, status, uh, and even if you look beyond the black box approach to the family and look within the family, the relationship uh, to the land of the woman in the household of the wife uh, is something that rarely gets discussed but is extremely uh, important. Uh, one round of research in southern India found that women whose name was on the land title were one-seventh as likely to be physically abused by their husband uh, as women whose name was not on the land title. And a lot of somewhat unexpected benefits come from long-term secure rights to land. And of course, long-term secure rights to land uh, are one very important product of effective rule of law. Um, a few examples might be of use in terms of how particular uh, legal reforms, which might seem very small adjustments in the way we do business, may provide uh, secure land rights to people who otherwise wouldn't have them. Uh, a major issue in recent years has been the security of land rights of indigenous populations and traditional holders. And one temptation has been, oh, well, let's go in and give individual title, then they'll all be secure. The problem that has been found in many country settings is if you give, uh, if you set up a program to give individual title uh, under circumstances where it may be uh, hijacked by urban elite or others uh, putting their claims ahead in line uh, with a population actually using the land that may be uh, illiterate or semi-literate, have no access to legal advice, no legal aid, uh, and very little communication or understanding of the rights that they're uh, supposed to have or how they are to go about uh, assuring those rights, you may end up, uh, you may end up with uh, people losing their land through a program that was intended to provide them title and security, uh, leading to the question, well, what then do we do nothing? Actually, there may be alternatives, and in that case, one alternative which we've found and in some cases been able to help put into policy and see implemented uh, is to define and assure and document community or group land rights, basically say, okay, within the boundaries of the land used by the group, we'll simply allow their customary legal arrangements, which might include allocation of, of land rights by elders or by chiefs or other 
senior members of the community. We'll let them operate at least up to a point. There may be situations such as denial of rights to women under customary rights where those would not be acknowledged. But up to that point, let it be done through internal governance, but at the same time, use the formal legal system to define and delineate the external boundaries of the community, uh, create documents on the public record which delineate those external boundaries, uh, and within those boundaries, uh, their rights remain as a group sacrosanct. That is, no mining company can come in, uh, no logging company can come in, no large agricultural investor can come in. The community is safeguarded within, uh, within those boundaries. Uh, one example of what may seem to be a fairly small adjustment, but that uh, can be extremely helpful. By the way, another issue that needs to be kept in mind if you're doing individual formal titling in, in the Western style uh, is that uh, often so-called secondary or minor rights to land uh, are lost in the process of formal titling. Uh, we have the technical uh, categories to recognize things like easements and uh, uh, profit à prendre and various other kinds of minor rights to land, but in a titling program, those tend to get lost. And very often those are rights such as, let's say, customary rights of women to gather for fallen branches or customary rights to gather mushrooms or customary rights to graze uh, during the off-season or to interplant uh, between trees. Uh, all of those rights may be threatened and lost in a formal titling program unless it's very carefully designed to take advantage of categories other than fee simple absolute, full private ownership, or its equivalent in other legal systems. Uh, another example of uh, something that seems very simple uh, in India, again, uh, you ask for examples we've seen or worked with, uh, in India, Landesa has worked with programs to provide microplots, uh, house and garden plots about one and a half times the size of a tennis, tennis court, tenth of an acre, uh, to completely landless families, transformative a family that gets uh, private ownership of a tenth of an acre, otherwise completely landless, uh, typically finds itself now producing all its vegetable needs, all or nearly all of its fruit needs, most of its dairy needs, producing in addition a cash income from sale of surplus equal to roughly $200 a year about what an ag laborer would earn in the field during the course of a whole year. So it's as though they added a further uh, wage earner to the, the household. And uh, if the wife uh, gets her name on the title, uh, which enhances the likelihood that she will control the production and income from the home garden, uh, that resource is used <clears throat> excuse me, in a much more effective way than an equivalent amount of income in the husband's hands for the basic needs of the family, ch children's nutrition, girl children, as well as boy children, uh, attendance at uh, basic school, uh, basic medical help, and so on. It's not that the husband won't spend any of the money on that sort of thing, but it's net of expenditures for gambling and tea in the village and so on. Um, one of the things that we found, uh, even though the program as legislated said that, um, uh, said that the husband and wife should both have their name on the title document as joint owners, 
uh, in doing field work and uh, monitoring and verification is, is really critical in such programs. We found that uh, uh, only the husband's name was on the title and in the early stages of the program. And I said, well, that's not what the law says. Why is this happening? I said, well, there's only one line uh, on the... Uh, on the title document. And I said, okay, well, if there's only one line in the title document, let's put the wife's name on it. And we found the administrators were very quick to add a second line to the document. Uh, <laughs> but we, we, we found we also had a good deal of leverage to insist that the wife's name now should come first on those two lines. Uh, that makes no legal difference whatsoever, but it, it seems to make a psychological difference that her name is first. So very small things, if you, if you follow the legal play-by-play -play closely on these things, uh, a, a number of moderate changes can be made. I, one major, major, oops, I'm getting close to my, <laughs> my eight minutes. I was going to talk about the land grab issue, but I'll I'm wait sure, for the sure back and forth. Attention. Thank you. Roy, I, I could listen to you for 15 minutes easily, but in fairness to our <laughs> other panelists, I better pass no, I'm, I'm the glad, on. I'm glad you alerted me. <laughs> and um, you work for um, Nestle, huge corporation. Um, Last year, it, it announced that it was going to invest a um, billion dollars over X number of years in Africa. Um, so Africa is obviously uh, a, a key a key area now for for your strategy. Mm -hmm. So, please tell us th the kind of things that you're you're do doing in terms of cocoa, coffee. Um, how you're working with smallholders there? Okay. Thank you, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here, and we've had some fascinating discussions so far. I'm sure this is going to continue. So Nestle firmly believes in the fundamental right of each person on this planet to have access to safe and nutritious food for an active and healthy lifestyle. And, and this goes beyond just food security, which has traditionally addressed just calories, but more and more we see it has to be nutrient security, really the correct nutrients. And we can contribute to all the steps across the chain from the farm through manufacturing, packaging, distribution and marketing to our consumers. But I'd like to give a couple of examples of what we're doing concretely in two main areas. The first is smallholder farmers and the second is urban consumers at the bottom of the economic pyramid. So firstly, for smallholder farmers, some concrete numbers, we actually purchase raw materials directly from close to 700,000 farmers, smallholders, and indirectly from somewhere between 5 and 7 million. And we have around 1,200 agronomists on the field that are working with these smallholder farmers to provide advice and training. In 2012, we actually trained 275,000 farmers. And the training includes information on good agricultural practices, advice, tools on water management, as well as nutrient flows, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And we're investigating means to reach an even higher number of farmers through connected agriculture and mobile phone technology. Some specific results include in Pakistan, in, which is one of our, uh, the areas where we have milk districts, uh, we've managed to reduce milk losses, which are typically somewhere between 15 and 17 percent, down to 0.6 percent. And this is a combination of training, but also investments in improved collection and cooling facilities. We're actually sourcing more and more of our raw materials locally. And then beyond training, one of our research and development uh, units in Tours in France, we're conducting research to develop high yielding drought resistant varieties of coffee and cocoa. 
And the reason we, we decided on coffee and cocoa is that it's of significant importance to our business, but there's really not many other companies interested in doing such research. Because seed companies like Syngenta are doing great work, but honestly, they're not so interested in selling something, a tree that's good for 30 years. They more want to sell seeds that are annual. So um, we decided to really focus on coffee and cocoa, and we have a huge genetic bank of coffee and cocoa varieties. So we're using sophisticated techniques to identify the genetic traits to give high yield and uh, disease resistance, the qualities that are required. These techniques are really non-GMO. We're not modifying any genetics. We're just using it as markers. So the, the, the technique is called marker-assisted selection. So then we can select amongst the natural genetic diversity the traits we require and then use conventional breeding to reinforce these traits. But this, is, this goes beyond just the uh, genetic identification. Then we're using accelerated propagation techniques to actually lead to large-scale quantities of these plants. So during last year, we actually delivered 12 million coffee trees and 1 million cocoa trees to smallholder farmers in the markets. And we're transferring this technology to different institutes in local countries and some of our experimental farms so that we can further accelerate the program. So this is an example of you know, what we call creating shared value. We can increase farmers' revenues. We're investing in local communities and bringing to Nestle higher quality products and assured supply for the future. Though I have to insist that we don't have any uh, that the, um, the smallholder farmers that receive our plants, they have no compulsion to sell to us. But, of course, you know, we encourage them to do so. And uh, to increase the, the, the resilience of these smallholders, we encourage them to grow other crops. Um, one example would be uh, growing cassava in the Ivory Coast, which has the advantage of having a more regular source of income for the farmers. And uh, the cassava we use in our own factory in the Ivory Coast. We recently opened a new, uh, re well, reopened the R&D centre in, in uh, Abidjan. And we have special programmes targeted in women in, in agriculture. We recently signed the UN Every Woman, Every Child uh, initiative, which has the intention to improve the rights and opportunities for women. And we are particularly focusing that on the cocoa supply chain. We have a collaboration with the Fair Labour Association, which we're working with in, in human rights and particularly in child labour. And we've asked them in this next phase of work to particularly focus on, on women's rights. Other examples would be the India Village um, Women's Development Programme, where we've trained 30,000 dairy farmers. And uh, in Pakistan, where with UNDP, we've trained 4,000 female livestock farmers. And there's many other examples. So those, those are just a few examples of um, smallholder farmers. And then if we come on to the second aspect, urban consumers. How can we bring safe and nutritious food to urban consumers? Well, we're continuing to invest in building factories closer to consumers. And uh, we've recently invested in some countries that probably not many other companies are in investing in, like building a factory in Angola, in Iran, and this approach is extremely important to reach other vulnerable parts of the population, uh, the urban poor. As Mark has already alluded, uh, the, 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 uh, the urban population is growing, and by 2050 it's estimated that 70% of the world's population will live in urban areas. Well, these people have little possibility to grow their own food. So, for this reason, we need safe and nutritious and affordable foods that are processed in a way to maintain the nutrition and ensure food preservation to reduce food waste. One of the areas that we're addressing is, on a significant scale, is micronutrient deficiencies, zinc, iron, vitamin A and iodine principally, which have dramatic consequences in terms of infant and maternal mortality impaired eyesight and stunting. Well, we're fortifying products with these minerals and vitamins 
And in 2012, we actually delivered 160 billion servings of these 45 products. The majority of them were products accessible to people right at the bottom of the economic pyramid, like Maggie cubes that consumers might buy one at a time in an open market or a mum and pop store, um, milk powders and infant um, and family or family cereals. And as a complement to this direct fortification, we are also have a program to develop and spread biofortified crops. So these are varieties that are naturally rich in these nutrients. And this will be both for our own products and for small farmers, uh, smallholders and their families to consume. We're very concerned that the cultivated varieties of staple crops have been bred really for yield, yield, yield and disease resistance and not for nutrition. And so we really believe it's very important to bring nutrition into plant breeding and into the, the staple crops. So in conclusion, we firmly believe in food justice and I trust that some of these examples have shown how we're doing actual actions behind these words and all of it needs to be done in a sustainable way to preserve the natural capital of our planet and to provide a solid future for the generations to come. Thank you, Anne. Um, it's interesting what you're doing with cocoa and coffee because somebody um, from Mars came to our office recently and they're doing exactly the same thing. So I suppose it's interesting to see how um, this convergence of thinking on, on certain issues. Um, Erich, as a um, senior campaign and advocacy advisor at Oxfam, part of your job is to uh, hold companies like Nestle and Syngenta to account, I suppose. And, and you've, you've been doing this through the Behind the Brands program. So tell us about the scorecard and how our guests fared. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you. Um, uh, for including me in this panel. Um, I, I want to start out with a few uh, just introductory remarks and, and statistics, and then I'll go into a little bit about our Behind the Brands campaign. Um, as we all know, the agribusiness revolution has delivered crops that were really unthinkable a um, hundred years ago. Efficient and effective supply chain management and a creative use of food technology has produced a lot of well-known brands that um, are well liked by consumers. We have much to celebrate, um, but reforms have to be made if we're going to solve hunger. In 2008, the spike in food prices pushed more than a million people, more than a hundred million people, excuse me, into poverty. And prices could spike yet another 150 percent over the next 20 years, stretching the income of billions of men, billions of men and women who live on less than two dollars a day beyond the brink. Poor people spend nearly 75% of their income on food and often depend on food assistance. High and volatile prices hit these people the hardest. And these statistics, of course, mask the millions of stories of families who struggle to cope with the deepening poverty and hunger that they face on a daily basis. By 2050, there will be 9 billion of us on this planet. And to meet the growing de demand, which is set to increase by 70% within the next 40 years, the food system will have to be transformed yet again. Our world already produces enough to eat for everyone. In fact, some would say it produces enough to feed 12 billion people. And yet, one in eight of us go hungry every night because of the deep imbalances in opportunity and the control of resources. And ironically, those who go without food are most intimately involved in its production. Female farmers, agricultural workers, and rural communities. At the same time, global agriculture is driven by a race for resources of land, water, and carbon. Since 1990, we have been improving food insecurity rates. But most of this progress was before 2007-2008. Since then, the progress has slowed and even leveled off. 
In February of this past year, Oxfam launched the Behind the Brands Scorecard. This scorecard ranked the top 10 food and beverage companies, including Nestle, which I'm happy to say was number one in our scorecard, um, albeit with a 56% ranking out of 100, but nonetheless number one. Um, and the, the scorecard essentially looked at 270 indicators over seven themes. Those themes were transparency as a meta theme, land, water, climate, women, workers, and smallholder farmers. With 270 indicators and 10 companies, there were nearly 3,000 data points in the scorecard that we looked at. And the scorecard is really based on the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. And the requirement that businesses respect human rights, conduct due diligence, and remedy violations. I'd like to go a little bit into why we chose these seven themes and why they're so important for food security. Beginning with transparency and due diligence. Transparency and due diligence allows investors, civil societies, and individuals to hold corporations accountable. It uncovers risks and human rights violations which can't be reflected if they are not, which can't be rectified, excuse me, if they are not known. With respect to land, in the past decade, it's estimated that nearly 200 million hectares of land, or an area eight times the size of the UK, has been sold off globally as land sales have rapidly accelerated. This land could feed a billion people, more than the number that go hungry each day. In poor countries, foreign investments have been buying an, an area of land the size of London every six days. These concessions are not being used to support food security, local food security. More than 60% of these foreign land investments is for export, and what is being produced is not food, but fuel. Most of the land being sold off is often highly productive and could be a solution for impro improving food security. Closely related to the race for land is the race for water. And like land, there won't be enough to go around. Water scarcity is already affecting almost one-fifth of the world's population, and water use has grown more than twice the rate of population growth. And agriculture is the single largest user of the world's fresh water, with about 70% of the world's water being used for irrigation. Not only is water scarce, but competition for water continues to grow, often putting a company's business needs in direct competition with local communities. Many companies, however, through initiatives like the CEO Water Mandate, are starting to address these concerns, but more can be done. For example, companies can begin by recognizing the human right to water as defined by the United Nations. Labor, of course, is also significant in agriculture. With over one billion employed in the agricultural sector, or nearly 35% of the global workforce, it is the second greatest source of employment worldwide. It's the most important sector for female employment in many countries, including in Asia and Africa. Agriculture is one of the three most hazardous sectors in the world. Out of some 335,000 335,000 fatal workplace accidents worldwide, about half of them occur in agricultural work, workers. And the incidences of worst forms of child labor is particularly high, with more than half of the 215 million child laborers being involved in agriculture. These workers fare worse than workers in any other sector worldwide today. Modern value chain development should make a positive difference in the lives and employment and prospects of these workers, but only if workers are provided with equitable and fair conditions. Next, we need to invest in resilience and adaptation to climate change. We know that erratic weather patterns and declining yields are being felt around the world, and agriculture is one of the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, and the companies whose businesses depend on agricultural products have to take the lead in mitigating global warming. Some major food companies are reporting some emissions data. Others haven't even begun. 
and most are failing to report the emissions from their agricultural production and related services, even though these emissions can account for nearly two-thirds of their carbon footprint. On the resilient side, companies can play a critical role in building climate preparedness, and we've already heard from Nestle how they're working on that with respect to drought. By partnering with smallholder farmers, they can increase their resilience to climate impacts, which will increase food security for their communities and reduce the risk to a company's supply chain. Which brings me to investing in small-scale farming. There are 500 million small farms in the developing world that support nearly 2 billion people. And yet, it is these same small-scale farmers who are the most food insecure due to a lack of access to markets, land, finance, infrastructure, and technologies enjoyed by the large farms. Recent experiences have shown that when properly organized, smallholder farmers can participate effectively in formal supply chains and are able to manage their risks even better in highly demanding markets. Finally, I want to talk about the investment in women's empowerment. In the broadest sense, we must realize that if we want to feed the whole world in the future, we need to focus on women. Women are overrepresented in precarious and low-wage jobs in agriculture. They have less access than men to resources crucial for, for producing food. They face an uphill battle in food production. 43% of the world's farmers are women, often doing the behind-the-scenes work like planting and weeding and home chores like gardening and cooking. And even though it is well known that women are especially active in producing many key crops, Companies that source from these women know little or nothing about them and have done little through their policies to account for the unique challenges that they face. In February, when we um, launched our scorecard, we also um, launched a campaign against the three chocolate companies, including Nestle, Mondelez, and Mars. And we asked them to look more broadly at the women in their cocoa supply chains and to do more for them. And I'm proud to say that after two months' time, all three companies um, agreed to our asks and agreed to do impact assessments in their cocoa supply chain on women and to carry out plans of action as a result of those impact assessments. And they also, all three of them, signed on to the UN Women's Empowerment in Principles as a result of our campaign. I just want to finish off by um, giving to you a couple interesting uh, quotes from some reports that I found fascinating. Uh, which actually speaks, I think, to a lot of what Ray, Roy was saying. Um, a recent Gates Foundation report says that when women don't control resources and income, their households might suffer from malnutrition. Men are less likely than women to reinvest their income in the health of the family. And in an FAO report, it says that women are the key to food security, stating that if women had equal access to agricultural resources and services, food security would be greatly improved and societies would grow richer, and not only in economic terms. But it isn't just NGOs and UN bodies claiming a good return on investment when providing resources and opportunities to women. Goldman Sachs, the large investment firm, also conducted research with the World Bank and concluded that investments in women, particularly in education and labor force participation, lead to real GDP growth as women take their earnings and invest them back in their families and communities. And recently, the billionaire and investment guru, Warren Buffett, also expressed his bullish take on women in an essay published in Fortune magazine, where he declared his optimism for America's future lies with American women, an untapped resource. So just to finish off, um, Oxfam believes that the Seven key areas for food insecurity as it relates to company practice are transparency, land rights, the right to water, labor rights, investments in adaptation and resilience, in small-scale farming, and in women's empowerment. They are not easy, but they are the key to feeding the 9 billion people that will be here in 2050. And none of them can be accomplished by business alone. It must be done in collaboration with government, civil society, and with the communities, farmers, and workers that are often bearing the brunt of an inequitable food system, yet have much to contribute to a food system that will work for all of us. Over to you. Thank you. I appreciate you all having uh, Syngenta to your forum. I used to live in the Islamic Republic of Mauritania. 
for a few years doing agricultural development down there. And, and uh, if I live to be a thousand years old, I will never forget something that happened. We were in one of the gardens watering the plant beds. And, uh, and normally in the kind of the, the landscape of the Sahel, there's, there's like this hazy, hot, milky white sky off in the distance. But this morning, the sky had turned pink. And then it started to turn more red. I'd never seen anything like it. And I looked at the, the, the women in this farming cooperative in complete unbelief and realized that it was, in fact, swarms of locusts. And we realized that those locusts were fixing to be amongst us. And sure enough, they came through and devoured and skeletonized every shred of living vegetation uh, in, our, in our garden in the town. And so we, to try to stop it, we, we took mosquito bed netting and we cut it up and we draped it over our plant beds to try to protect the, the crops from, from uh, uh, locusts and other predatorial insects. Didn't do any good. But um, by the way, that's not what you're supposed to do with mosquito bed netting. And, and uh, we did learn a, a couple days later that US, the U.S. Agency for International Development sent a few, a few crop dusters to treat for, for the locusts. It was too late for us. So I, I, one of the many things I learned is there are better ways to control uh, uh, pests than with, with mosquito nets. I want to make two points. The first is we want to work with you. Um, we, we need rule of law in, in the countries we operate in. And, and the second point is, the way we define food security, I mean, this is both from my, my personal conviction and the way you know, Syngenta lingo, lingo, global food security to us means the combination of smallholder farmers with modern agricultural innovation, bringing those two together. I'll come back to that point in a second. But first of all, we want to work with you. We need the rule of law as a, as a societal foundation in these emerging markets we're going into. First of all, because it's the right thing to do. I mean, if we could get all uh, countries and governments to agree on that, then, then we could stop the talk right here. And from a purely pragmatic standpoint, companies like ours are, are a little nervous, going, especially our lawyers, going into developing countries where there's not a serious legal framework and enforcement. And it's written all over the, the, the mission of the World Justice Project. I pulled a couple items from it, from the WJP, where they talk about how we need legal justice so that, for example, children are sent to school and not exploited for cheap labor. They also say local business and foreign investment aren't stifled by corruption. Let's take Syngenta's Africa investment as an example. Last year we announced that we're going to put about $500 million into seven main countries in Africa. We're going to hire about 700 employees. These would be uh, Africans who are specialists in, in crop production, agronomy, these sort of disciplines. So here you have a case of a rather bold CEO saying that he's going to put 500 million U.S. dollars of somebody else's money, by the way, in other words, shareholder money, and in 10 years, by 2022, try to build a $1 billion business across the continent. And you can't do that in countries that are rife with corruption. You can't do that in countries that have a regime change every other week, that are in a constant state of, of coup d'etat. And we also won't get there through paternalism. I think the paternalistic model and development was, you know, was tried in the mid-60s through the 80s. It was tried and failed. We think we'll get there through public and private partnerships, where you ultimately give the ownership of those projects to the host country nationals, and where we have relatively, uh, relatively predictable markets. As many of you uh, will recall, President Obama was just uh, doing a tour of Africa last week, 
And when he was on his when he was on Air Force One going down from Dakar to Johannesburg, he had what they call a press gaggle, you know, where he just does interviews with reporters. And he was talking about uh, he was talking about what he, he his his uh, new alliance for food security. And here's what he said. One of the main things that we want American companies to see is that Africa is ready to do business. And that's why our first message in Africa revolved around issues of democracy, transparency, accountability. Those countries where businesses can feel confident that there will be a peaceful transition of power, that corruption is prosecuted, where there's a rule of law, where there's protection of private uh, property, that is what will attract, attract businesses. And so this is, I mean, we're, Sanjit is sort of buying what the president's selling here. We, uh, this is a big part of the reason that we've signed uh, a memorandum of, of understanding with the U.S. Agency for International Development. We also did an MOU not too long ago with uh, the uh, Fair Labor Association. But I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, and pretend that the business community has all, has all the answers to the challenges of global food security. We do not have an unblemished record especially chemical companies. Uh, agriculture is, for many reasons, one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world. If you look at our environmental footprint, when it comes to production agriculture, we use 70% of the world's fresh water. So somehow, we've got to strike the balance between sustainable intensive agriculture and, and environmental protection. And we are, we're doing it, first of all, and, and are supremely confident we can continue to do so. To put it a little bit differently, we've got to grow more from less resources on the existing amount of land so you don't plow into, into, uh, into more fragile land. In the, going back to the context of food security as a basic human right, I think, Mark, you're referring, it for referring to, the, to, to Article 25, um, the Declaration of Human Rights, the right to food. Um, we've kind of the evolution or the renaissance at Syngenta is, we, is that we historically call on larger farmers. You know, it's just easier. It's a simpler business model. And at some point, we've, we've awoken to the reality that 90% of the world's farmers farm less than two hectares of land. And to make those smallholders uh, be able to compete on a, on a global stage, we have to start tailoring and supporting their specific needs. In addition to that, it's become like blindingly obvious to us that we've got to start paying attention to women smallholders. Women are the main producers of about 70% of the staple crops in lesser developed countries. Women perform about 60-70% uh, of the agricultural tasks, and yet women own, women smallholders own less than 1% of the land. Uh, we, we've got a lot of programs going on. I'm not, I won't go into them. We, we can get into it in Q&A if you like. Uh, we, we, it, I did want to mention in Vietnam we're working with companies like Pepsi and, and Nestle, who you may have heard of, on, on developing smallholder farmers in coffee and, and potatoes. But the, the, the point really is that you know, we can't do this stuff by our, our, ourselves. My appeal to you is that we've, we've, we've got to get over the polemics and stigmatization of big, big business in the developing world. And, and we've got to form public and private partnerships where companies are held accountable by shareholders and NGOs like Oxfam, for example, and where the governments themselves are held accountable by sound science and the rule of law. So thanks, and I look forward to getting into the discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Angus. Um, certain common themes emerging, uh, the role of women. It, it's just um, it, it's just amazing how when you cover development, how you keep returning to the role of women, adolescent girls, the importance of getting girls into schools, um, preventing early marriage, early pregnancy. It's just a, a thread that runs through 
all debates in, in development, and, and here it's, it comes up again in food security. Anyway, um, time for, for questions from you. So, um, I mean, I have some, but since you're kind enough to come to this session, um, I'm handing it over to you now. So, are there, are there any questions, any takers? Anybody? Yeah, please. Perhaps you can speak up or maybe go to the mic. Okay, good. Um, my name is Renford. I work with uh, Citizens for Justice, it's based in Malawi. And um, thank you very much for this very informative discussion. I would like to give uh, special thanks to, to Angus from, from Singenta. It, it takes a lot to, to come there and, and and say stuff like that. Um, I'm going to tell a very short um, story. My grandmother is about eight, nine years old now. In the last couple of decades, she used to, to recycle her seeds. So every year she grow, she harvest, she grow it back, and now things have changed. For the last five, seven years, every year she has to go buy seeds and plant. And then she has to go buy fertilizer. The last two years, she has not been able to buy seeds and buy fertilizer to grow. So literally her land, she has lost the piece of land. And then we have had a biofuel company that have come into the community, taken her land, they've, brought, they've, grown, they've, they've uh, grown Jetrofa and, and sent it to the Netherlands, to TNT. TNT is a, is a, is a, is a, is a company, for some that don't know. So what I'm saying is that um, there is a serious concern from people, from where I come from, that says big business is keeping small farmers out of, out of production. Because you're producing these one generation seeds that farmers can't afford to buy every year, they can't afford to buy fertilizer every year, and then they, they, they don't have something to put on the table. So we have a situation where the corporation is having control over seeds, over fertilizer, and so where is the humanity of the thing that we do? Where is the humanity of a profit? I'm, I'm throwing this out to the group, and I'll, I'll leave it there for now, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that's one of the concerns that NGOs have expressed about the new alliance, that kind of scenario cropping up. So that question is obviously at your feet, Angus. Well, thank you for starting off with an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question is around, uh, do, do smallholder farmers feel like, let's call it captive customers? with, uh, particularly in the seeds area. Uh, you, you described your, your, your mother uh, as not, no longer saving her, no, no longer kind of holding on to or saving her seeds. Um, she, she still has the, certainly the ability and the right to save her seeds if she wanted to, if I'm, unless, I, unless, you, unless you tell me differently. Yeah. yeah. What kind of seeds is she growing? Corn. Corn. So with corn, you're talking to, you're talking about hybrids. So with each, I won't get into, I won't give you a plant physiology lesson, but corn, you, you, you uh, each year if it's a hybrid, the the quality of seed goes down. Um, with if if we're talking about biotech corn, the um, these are you you dealing with you get into areas of intellectual property, uh, you get into areas of you know. The, the farmer has to, at the end of the day, has to say, does she or he want to invest in a, uh, high, a high value hybrid, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, GM, maybe it's not corn. Um, if, if they want to, they can do that. They're certainly under no obligation to. If when they want to grow, grow what we call brown bag seed or, or conventional seed, that's the option too. I mean, it, it's basic economics. You have to look at what's going to work locally for your farming operation. So, if uh, if you want to buy the more expensive seed, the, if you want the, pardon the expression, the Cadillac treatment, you can you can you can do that. Uh, it, you probably need some microfinancing available, um, or you can grow a conventional seed. So, the farmer still has a choice. Um, we're bringing 
not just crop inputs as, and, as, one, as, as one offering, but also like the, the, the agronomic knowledge, particularly uh, in places like Malawi where we're doing our, um, our Can I our just investment. go go back and clarify? Is is your mother using conventional seeds, or why why can she not use the seed again as she used to? Is it because she's buying it from a seed company like Syngenta? She, she, she buys agribusiness is really in the face of everything. So a couple of years ago she used to have the traditional seed varieties, but now they're lost. So every year she has to go buy it from. So the she's lost a conventional she seed now. No, nobody has it in her village. And I yeah. Roy, do you, do you have uh, some no, observations about this situation? I'm not, not really on that. I mean, there are clearly some very complex intellectual property issues yeah. at play, and there are some companies that seem to be asserting rights in a stronger way than, uh, than others are. I, I, it is important, clearly, for all of those involved as middle persons or supporters in, in, in the agricultural sector to recognize that small farmers, and at least in this case it is a small farmer, she hasn't been displaced or evicted. I actually had thought that by this time in the discussion there would have been more of a focus on another very troublesome issue, which is the so-called land grab uh, or uh, land rush uh, issue, w which has, of course, received a yeah. lot of media yeah. but attention. Eric, Eric um, did, did draw attention to that issue, but on, on, on the question of seeds, um, Eric, I mean, that's probably an issue of concern for Oxfam. It's talked about this. Um, actually, I'm not aware if we if we we probably do have some reports on this. Mm -hmm. um, I know one of the things um, that we do in terms of engaging companies is to have companies partner with smallholders to get them those technologies. So if I'm a company that's sourcing from a cocoa farmer or a coffee farmer or what have you, to make sure that I'm putting some of my technologies and my investments into that small holder who's producing that raw material for me. Because oftentimes what we find is that the growers actually get squeezed. They typically are the ones that are carrying all the risk for these companies um, by having to produce, you know, pr purchase the seeds or the inputs or the fertilizers or what have you. Um, and also the burden of climate impacts and, and all of that. Um, and very rarely is it the manufacturer down the chain that is actually taking on those risks in that same way. And so one of the things Oxfam's very clear on is that it needs to be a partnership. There needs to be shared risk and shared value throughout the supply chain. Thank you. Hi. Anyone Next question? Else? At the back? Oh, sorry. Why, why did you go first and then, and then you? Right. The right to food goes beyond access. There is contamination, genetic engineering, promotion of disease, chronic diseases, sugar in food. We, Nestle, spoke about assisted, um, uh, marker assisted selection. Does that include chemicals? Chemicals. 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 Uh, we uh, talk about accelerated growth. Uh -huh. Does that include chemical? What are the impacts for genetic uh, manipulation, chronic diseases? Because contaminated milk is linked to diabetes. How do we protect the most vulnerable? When we do hybrid, seeds and we have not patent the local seed who gets the reward for those seeds when the local seed was used to produce the hybrid seed and 
land. Land is no longer important because as such, unless it's for housing, because we can use small plots to promote agriculture, for high tech agriculture. We speak about um, meat and meat contamination. The other day we had beef with horse meat and nobody took responsibility. How many persons were contaminated? How many persons picked up some disease because of that? We're not hearing about these things. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Anne, on um, chemicals, yeah. use of chemicals? First of all, yeah, marker-assisted selection is not at all genetic manipulation. It's evaluating the wild, the, the diversity of the natural varieties that exist. Because actually, for all crops, we only cultivate a very small, very, very small percentage of the existing natural diversity. But it's using just screening techniques to find those, those varieties that have the required traits. And there's no genetic manipulation and no chemical manipulation. It's just a means of selection. And then the propagation is also, it's natural breeding techniques. It's no, there's no chemicals involved. No, but when I um, manipulate genes to have acceleration, you must use some chemical. But you must use something to get that accelerated growth. I'm a scientist, I'm a medical scientist. You know, you must use, you know, so that uh, it's not, I don't know. It's not, it's not manipulation at what all. What do you use to get accelerated growth? It's not accelerated growth. It's accelerating the, the multiplication. What so do you using, get for it's multiplication? Use, it's using cell techniques to grow small, it's, which ends up in small seedlings. Do you add additional cells to get no, more cells? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. I'm not sure about it's that. just means of, 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 of propagating them faster. And then they end up in small plants that are then grown in our greenhouses and then transferred to the markets. How do you get rid of disease resistance from those plants? Perhaps, perhaps yeah. You, yeah. you can um, pursue this with um, Anne mm -hmm. afterwards so that we can yeah. give an opportunity to another questioner. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm John Carling and I, I work with the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, meaning I, uh, we work around Asia among the indigenous peoples and of course they're very much part of, uh, affected by this whole issue. Now my question is more uh, general to all of you in terms of how do you actually define uh, food justice? Because it's, it's not, if, if we define food justice, it's, it's clearly that it should be human rights based. However, how do you then define the roles of, say, big business, governments, small producers, landowners, so that we achieve food justice? Because unless we do that, I, it's, it's like now, obviously, business will get into the, into the food production for, for profit, obviously, not to meet the need for sustainable food. They will determine, they control, they determine what will be produced and how it will be produced, by which how much profit they gain. It's not about what we need that will sustain the, uh, the, the basic needs of, 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 of human, that will sustain our environment, that will keep us healthy. That's not the defining factor, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud on how do we actually uh, define uh, food justice when we talk of, of food justice and ensuring that there is respect for rights, there's sustainability, there's environment integrity, and, and, the, and the health and well-being of the people are really protected. Okay, thanks. Um, we did have a go at this ourselves last night, um, <laughs> didn't we? Um, Roy. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I, I you're the why. You're the uh, probably the uh, the wisest of us. Um, well, I don't here, know. Since you've been around longer than us, That's, but, uh, uh, I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> but, but food justice. I mean, I suppose um, one way of going about it is um, is to talk about the voluntary guidelines, which um, came out of the Committee for Food Security. Um, in Rome, a collection of 
UN, private sector, civil society, they all talked for years about um, trying to lay down voluntary guidelines for um, land use, I suppose. Um, well, I, do, you, do you think that's, that, that is part of the picture of, of food justice? Well, for, first of all, I, just, I was looking to make sure I was correctly citing the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which are really, I think, a very important benchmark in terms of where we want to be. As I, I think I'm right in recalling that they call for cutting in half yeah. the number of hungry people yeah. from uh, 1990, 1990 yeah. to yeah. 2015. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to be critical, but I, I, I have always thought it was a bit of a cop-out that they started in 1990 rather than talking about reducing by half from the year 2000, which yeah. is when the MDGs sure. were, were, uh, were adopted. I, I mean, it seems to me that I would argue that there's a pretty simple definition of food justice, and that is that the number of hungry people on the planet becomes zero. I, I don't, until it's zero, I don't think that there's food justice on the planet. Uh, but then the point is that it can be done. And there's, I, and there was, we've got a lot of technical expertise on this panel. And I don't think that uh, it would be denied that we could, let's say, double the production of food on the planet. But there are a number of things that we need to do in, in order to make that possible and in order to make it possible for the food that's produced to get to those who need it mm. and are hungry. In particular, that the small farmers themselves are able to, uh, among other things, make the investments in their land, which means they have to have secure land rights. And I think that that's a probably an explicit link uh, that, that needs to be discussed uh, more, more frequently and openly, that unless farmers do have secure rights on their land, they're not able to make mid to long term investments, which excludes a whole bunch of things that are needed to improve and diversify production on the land. So we're really, through, through a legal through legal system measures that make farmers insecure on much of the land on the planet, we lose the advantage of their applied labor and, and resources in improving that land and making much more productive and versa. By the way, one of my favorite statistics is from the land reform on Taiwan, 49 to 53, when tenant farmers became owners of their land. Uh, during the 10 years following that land reform program, rice production increased by 60% and farm income increased by 150%, which is a sign that they were not only increasing the production by 60% of their basic crop, they were also diversifying into higher value crops. And if you do research there, you find in talking to farmers, uh, all of the sweat equity investments and capital investments that they were making to make those improvements possible. This can happen on a global level, uh, but it, it, it is going to require the, the legal, so the rule of law applied to small farmers to make all or nearly all small farmers secure on their land so that they can invest and, and improve. And it's, it's the disadvantage of all of us on the planet when small farmers in large numbers don't have those secure rights. But um, as you said, Eric, some people think we produce enough food already, um, in fact, more than we need. So it's not a question of producing more food. It's access to food, isn't it? It's, people don't get food because they're they're poor and they can't afford to buy it. I mean, it's, it's poverty rather than production. But if you, uh, but if you produce it yourself, that yeah. automatically gives you access. And because yeah. so many of those on the planet are yeah. those who produce yeah. food themselves, and that, that gives us a huge leg up, at least, when those yeah. people can be highly productive and eat what they produce. 
part of the solution, and that is reducing food waste. Uh, Absolutely. 40% of the world's food is wasted, and if we can address those issues, then we're well on our way to achieving mm -hmm. this goal. Mm -hmm. I like uh, Ron, Roy's simple definition of food security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Chifundo from Malawi. Uh, just picking up on the issue of wastes, how does the issue of subsidies in the agricultural sector in Europe, for example, factor into that attitude of waste and uh, therefore impact on the whole issue of food justice, where you have a whole regime actually that broke down the last WTO discussions because people are just fed up about the whole arrangement, the hypocrisy of the whole situation. How does that factor into this discussion of waste and food justice in general? Well, um, yeah, <laughs> um, I won't speak specifically to the EU subsidies. We have our own in the U.S., um, which we also talked about last night. <laughs> um, and, you know, clearly it's distorting uh, the market and, and uh, creating food waste in, in markets where we have too much um, and uh, not enough in, in markets where they don't have enough. Um, I will say, I mean, Oxfam has consistently been opposed to many of these subsidies um, in the U.S. in the Farm Bill. We've, we've, we've lobbied hard against many of them. In this recent Farm Bill, one of the key things we were lobbying for was actually um, looking more at ensuring that food aid reform was occurring um, so that food aid that's being um, given in Africa is actually being given by local partners as opposed to being shipped by U.S. businesses um, from the U.S. so that, again, we have regional food systems where local people are feeding themselves as opposed to, um, you know, creating a subsidized system that just increases, you know, the profits of American businesses. So, you know, Oxfam's worked hard on those issues. I, I know Angus knows a lot actually about subsidies, so he, he might have something to say yes, about this too. Yes, since you're in the EU, uh, <laughs> yeah, you probably have a quite yeah. a close, close up look at mm -hmm. European subsidies. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, 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 I, I mean, I'm, I failed to mention I live in Brussels these days and used to be in our, our Washington, D.C. office. I mean, Syngenta doesn't meddle in the, in, the, in the farm bill or the common agricultural policy here in Europe. We, we don't like to get in, in between our our farmer customers, uh, but I could just make some general observations. You said you're from Mali? Sorry? From Malawi. Two from Malawi, okay. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a choice of the, Mala uh, uh, the Malawian people, choice of your government. It, however, there's no denying that subsidies are, are trade distorting or market distorting, and that's why there are so many arbitration case, cases at the World Trade Organization. Um, Brazil, I think, intervened uh, in, a, in a cotton case in one against the U.S. So the U.S. said it's changed its, its cotton subsidy program. Um, so there's, uh, there's no doubt it, it, it distorts the market and it's not a level playing field and it puts African smallholder farmers at a distinct disadvantage. I would, I would add, though, that, that I think a lot of, um, uh, a lot of countries problems are more internal. I mean, I think the, the, the larger problems are, are weather, or, or resilience, climate change, and, and bad governments. I mean, I, 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 bad governance is in, is in government corruption. I mean, I think those, are the, the, those problems uh, overshadow the, the, um, the threat of, of sub, subsidies from the wealthier countries in the Northern Hemisphere. Just quickly, the a related problem which uh, needs to be kept in mind is subsidies and other legal system provisions that in, encourage or even require the production of biofuel mm -hmm. crops on land that could be used to feed people. And we used to argue about whether it was good to produce uh, grains to feed animals, and they will, uh, feeding animals instead of people, but at least the people eat the animals. Uh, people don't eat the cars. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Thank you for that, Roy. Um, <laughs> I think that's a, a, a good place to end. Um, since it's getting near four o'clock, and I think there's other panels starting then. So, um, just to sum up, we know what needs to be done, really. I mean, the certain themes do keep cropping up. Get rid of subsidies, empower women, um, um, cut down waste. Um, but as usual, it's the, kind of, it's the, the political uh, will to try and tackle those things. Um, I want to thank the panel, Angus, um, Irit, Anne, and Roy. Um, I, I learned a lot, and uh, I hope we learned a lot from each other, and uh, I hope you did too. And thank you very much for attending. Thank you. <laughs>